Unlike any other substance, PCBs are the living proof of the fact that once chemicals are released into the environment, they remain there for generations. When PCBs were first introduced in the 1920s, they were considered invaluable in electrical equipment, in buildings and in machinery. The chemicals are practically invisible and are not something ordinary people come in contact with. But a mere few generations later, PCBs had imperceptibly spread all over the world and are now to be found in both animal and human organisms, as well as in foodstuffs. When in the 1970s it first became evident that PCBs were a health hazard, they were banned by most of the developed countries. But it was too late, for PCBs don't simply disappear. On the contrary, they continue to do harm to this very day. Now, in one lifespan, the future came rushing in like an avalanche. Here was power, unbelievably versatile power. Titanically muscle power, leaping to any task. Incredibly delicate power responding with instant precision to the tiniest signal. With the birth of the electrical age, a nation's standard of living surged forward. The prevalence of electricity has been a key factor in industrialization, so its use as an energy form in most types of products has through time skyrocketed. And a certain group of chemical substances, PCB for one, because of its being a kind of liquid electric insulation, has played a significant role in the distribution of electricity. PCB, first commercially manufactured in 1927, is a syrupy, sticky substance. There definitely was the right time for this substance because we had learned how to generate electricity. We got the electric light bulb. Uh, we began to develop instruments and machines that uh, needed electricity. Transformers, generators on telephone poles all across the country. As the electricity came in, they loaded those things with PCBs. And we wouldn't have nationwide distribution of electricity uh, if it hadn't been for the PCBs. After the introduction of PCB, it was found to have many useful properties for a wide range of products not only for its resistance to thermal breakdown, but also because it could make other substances more pliable. Soon, the consumption of PCB quickly rose to several thousand tons. They were used as hydraulic fluids. They were added to paints, to ceiling tiles, to linoleum. They were used in carbonless paper in the days before the word processor, and many, many domestic uses. Basically, PCBs became that product that we introduced into practically everything where there was a possibility that this material would catch on fire. Any organic material is going to burn, but by putting PCBs into this organic material, it didn't flame up, it didn't burn, and it slowed down that process. They put it in the concrete and then the, the materials that we're putting in our walls so our buildings wouldn't catch on fire. We've saved a lot of lives. We prevented a lot of fires because of the PCBs. They became very much a part of our lives. In the 1940s and 50s, when the chemical industry was prospering, many new products, such as nylons, plastic containers, fire extinguishing agents and pesticides were launched, along with a number of chemicals which soon began to leave their mark on daily life. But by the early 60s, some of these new chemical substances were suspected of contaminating both nature and, perhaps, people. One such substance was the insecticide DDT, which had been dispersed over cities and fields since the 1940s in order to combat diseases and vermin, resulting later in traces of it being found not only in various species of birds, but also in agricultural products such as eggs, milk, butter and meat. 
But when scientists began to trace DDT in humans, that wasn't all they found. I got the task to analyze the Swedes for DDT and found, of course, DDT. But I did more than that because in the chromatograms that showed the DDT, there were eight unknown peaks, each of them representing one substance. But we did not know what it was. At Stockholm's Museum of Natural History, eagle feathers have been collected since 1888. When Søren Jensen began examining them, he found that from 1942 onward, there was a particular chemical which peaked, but which wasn't DDT. And when, after two years' research, Søren Jensen found excessively large concentrations of these chemicals in a dead white-tailed eagle, he managed to isolate and identify the unknown substances as being PCB and discovered them in some rather unexpected places. Just for curiosity, I analyzed my own hair, my wife's hair and all the kids. And it turned up that I had the highest level, my wife also very high. And among the children, the youngest, still breastfeeding had the highest level of both PCB and DDT. I think that many societies got more or less a shock because in the past you have learned that DDT was spread onto the vegetation to uh, fight against uh, insects and so But uh, all knowledge about the PCB was that it was used in closed system. And how could it come out then? Because half a year after the discovery, it was found all over the world. PCBs had apparently leaked from machines, buildings and electrical appliances into the environment. And as became evident, PCB, just like DDT, is accumulated in the food chain right from minute quantities in microorganisms and small herbivores to quantities millions of times higher at the top of the food chain, in carnivores and humans. It was, however, as yet still not widely acknowledged that PCBs were harmful to people. That is, until a serious food poisoning accident in a Japanese food factory in 1968 shed new light on the chemicals.